For these next few moments, I want to talk with you about a topic I title, What Really Matters. So open your Bibles, the second Samuel chapter 9. This begins a brand new three-week teaching series on this topic. We've learned that life is complicated and uncertain. And so we find ourselves at different junctures in our lives asking ourselves tough questions. Questions like, why am I here? Why do I exist? And if you're asking yourself these kinds of questions, you're not weird. You're human. And these kinds of reflective questions help us to really extract a greater and deeper meaningfulness in life. Bible characters also ask these questions, so it's not unusual. I want to take a look at the life of David at a particular juncture in his life because the question, what really matters, came to surface. And I want to see how he answered it. David at this time was now king of Israel. He's the second king. And for a span of 10 years prior to him being king, he actually ran for his life because the current present king at that time, Saul, the first king of Israel, was so jealous of David that he tried to kill him several times. Once David is now sitting on the throne of the, of the nation of Israel, the nation was fragmented into two major factions. David spent the next seven years uniting Israel. So we see a span of 17 years. Having been now comfortable sitting on the throne, a united nation, these questions begin to come to the surface, posed a little bit differently, but in essence still the same thing, what really matters. Let's look at verse 1. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He's at the house of Machir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. Let's stop there. I want you to come join me in the palace where David is sitting on the throne. Something's troubling him. And he just can't put his finger right on what that is, but he does know that I'm missing something in my life. And all of a sudden, this question percolates, not in private, but in public. Because he may have asked himself the same question privately. Now it's public. He says, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? And then they said, yeah, yeah, there's... There's Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, Saul's grandson. What David has realized that amidst all of his accomplishments and successes, there was something amiss in his life. And he realized that success was empty. So it became clear. There's more to life than success. And I want you to take note of this point because it's, it's very essential, particularly as we're venturing into this new year. 
And if you're like me, I got to make my goals. I got to write them down. Family goals, business goals, financial goals, educational goals, physical goals in terms of exercise, you know, ethical and social goals. I, I got to have goals in those major dimensions of life so I can feel as if I'm going to go through this year with this sense of stride and purpose. But then you got to take a step back and say, most people set their sights on success the attainment of wealth, position, honors, the like. And they make success their supreme goal. And there's nothing wrong with success. Don't, 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 don't misunderstand. There's nothing wrong with success. The problem is, it's just unfulfilling. Success is largely an external indicator of one's significant accomplishments. Your degrees, how much money you have in a bank, your stock portfolio, you know, where you are in terms of your career path, those kinds of things, the accolades that most people on the planet pursue doggedly. But success, it's, it's, it's like a bottomless pit. It can never be filled up. The more you have, the more you want. The more you achieve, the more you see that you want to achieve. In fact, when you read the eighth chapter of 2 Samuel, it lists for us the resume of David's military accomplishments. It's very, very... It's almost, you're saying, man, this guy did all that. He had all those successes. It says David defeated the Philistines. One of the most powerful nations in the world at that time. David wiped them out. David defeated the Moabites, another powerful nation. He defeated them. David defeated the king of Zobah, capturing a thousand chariots. Powerful accomplishment. David defeated the Arameans, a superpower in his day. And then he placed garrisons throughout their entire country. David defeated the Edomites, another superpower, and placed garrisons throughout their country. And if that wasn't it, 2 Samuel 8 verse 13 says, David became famous. This guy had wealth, because whenever you defeat a nation, the spoils of war, that's yours. He had wealth, prominence, position, power, fame, in fact, in other passages, it says David was handsome and of good form. The brother had everything. <laughs> but something was missing. And he just couldn't put his finger on what was missing, though he had all the trappings and the textbook definition of success. You look up success in a dictionary, you see David's picture. But something was missing. And verse 3 tells us, the king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There's still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. D David was, was, was longing for something that success couldn't deliver or produce. Money couldn't buy it. Fame couldn't gain it. Military strength couldn't win it. When the feelings of the emptiness of success begins to loom heavy on your mind, you have a choice. One option? Keep gathering more and more stuff, hoping that the next gathering of stuff will satisfy the empty heart. The second option, practice the golden rule as Jesus presented it. Matthew 7 verse 12, our Lord said, In everything you do, be careful to treat others in the same way you'd want them to treat you. For that is the essence of all the teachings of the law. And the prophets. It's as if David shifted his focus. He said, I got everything, but I'm missing something that success 
can't give me. And he started focusing on it. He says, is there anyone left of the household of Saul? Saul? His household? The very king? Inflamed by jealousy and tried to kill David over a 10-year swath of time? David's asking about someone from Saul's lineage? Is there anyone left of the household of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? He asked among his court officials. They said, yeah, well, we know a guy named Ziba who used to work for Saul. Let's get him. Ziba comes into the, the palace. There he is in the court of David. David poses the question, is there anyone left of Saul's household that I can show God's kindness to? Ziba reflects for a moment. He says, yeah, yeah, there's, there's Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the grandson of Saul, but he's lame in both feet, which is indicative of something for that culture. David said, where, where, where is he? He's in Lodabar. He's staying at the house of Machir, the son of Amiel. Now, Lodabar, the very name of that remote village in Israel, it means the place of naught or the place of nothing. He's living in a place called nothing. And he's staying at the house, not of relatives, but of a family that just, they feel sorry for him. He's not able to work. He's not able to take care of himself. And so he's living in the home of a family that out of their compassion and empathy and just this sense of social goodness, Mephibosheth's staying there. Here is Mephibosheth, a prince, living as a pauper in a place called nothing. And he's lame in both feet. David barks out an order. Go get him. They go to this, this nothing of a place to find this broken man. And they bring him to the palace. And Mephibosheth was lame because when he was five years old, his father, Jonathan, his grandfather, Saul, were both at war. They both killed, got killed the same day. And so the protocol in the kingdom is that, look, Whoever takes over the kingdom now is going to kill all the heirs of Saul. And so the nurse you know, grabbed up five-year-old Mephibosheth and ran to hide him somewhere. As she's running out of the palace of Saul, she slips, Mephibosheth falls, and there he gets injured in both his feet and becomes someone that's lame. And, and, and he grows up now not knowing how to run, how to play, how to do the things that normal kids would experience. And here he is as an adult, never before entered the palace of a king. David's palace is far more grand than his grandfather's. He walks into the palace, the tapestry, the architecture, the grandness, the beauty. They bring him into the court of David. And David says, Mephibosheth, the message version of the Bible says that he starts to stammer. At your service. Because he's afraid. Because he knows that a new king would kill the heirs and the descendants of the former king to establish his throne. So he's afraid. He's thinking that he's, he's going to be wiped out. I'm here today and I'm going to be killed in, in, a, in a moment. And so David says, don't be afraid. I want to restore to you, give back to you all the property of your grandfather Saul. And I want you to eat at my table. Mephibosheth, stammering. Who, who, who am I? I, I, I? I'm a dead dog. And I said, I, I can't be of any harm to you. I, I, I'm a dead dog. I can't bark. I can't, I can't whimper. I, I, I can't even growl. I can't even snarl. I'm dead. 
So this man was so filled with this, this sense of shame and debasement and worthlessness. And he described himself in this self-deprecating kind of way to say that not only am I a dog, I'm a dead dog. I, I'm of no value to anybody, not even to myself. Somehow, this successful king needed Mephibosheth. He needed to show kindness to someone that couldn't repay him. See, success, it's so empty. It's so unfulfilling. And David learned that day. All my successes, all my wealth, all my accomplishments, all my fame. I got this big gaping hole in my soul that success can't fill up. This year as you're going through your goals, pursuing your dreams, chasing after the next rung on the ladder, the next star in your crown, and I'm not opposed to that. You need goals. The Bible teaches to have a goal-centric life. But will you get a fresh perspective and put at the top of your list of goals that I'm going to do like David, not pursue success, I'm going to pursue significance. Bob Buford, an American businessman, very successful, he said, whatever success you're having will never completely fulfill you. A life of significance, of really mattering, is yours for the taking. This, this king, he's... He reached into the life of someone that could not repay him. Not only to help Mephibosheth experience a measure of life that would be satisfying, but the king realized that as he was helping Mephibosheth, he was helping himself. There's more to life than success. Significance is greater than success. David discovered something that few people ever do, the value of significance. Not every successful person has significance, but every person who has significance is successful. Now, I'm not trying to be clever and give you one of those mind benders, but it's worthy for me to repeat. Not every successful person has significance, but every person who has significance is successful. We all know people that are very successful in all of the natural definitions of success. But there's nothing about them that's admirable where they fall into the category of significance. Significance conveys meaningfulness. Significance lives on a higher plane than wealth, fame, or honor. In fact, let's explore for a moment the difference between success versus significance because there's a drastic difference. Success puts focus on self. You are consumed with the idea of your goals, your dreams, your needed accomplishments to feel successful. Significance puts focus on others. David became focused on showing God's kindness to Mephibosheth. Success hoards. You're driven by the desire for more and more stuff. Outward signs of success. Significance shares. David didn't see wealth as something for mere accumulation. He practiced generosity, a sign of significance. Success is about wealth. You're motivated to accumulate wealth, more money to create a personal sense of achievement. Significance is about satisfaction. David felt dissatisfied with success. It was only when he practiced generosity towards someone who could not repay him, who could not reciprocate in kind, that he felt a deep sense 
of satisfaction. Success is empty. You're left wanting something more, though you don't know what it is. Significance feels fulfilling. David felt fulfilled because his life now had a deeper sense of meaning. Success is temporal. It's fleeting and short-lived. You're left craving something else, something more, and something different. Success ends a day that you die. When you die, we can't bury your stuff with you. Someone else gets your stuff. Because success is temporal. Significance is eternal. David have felt attached to God, the eternal one, by his actions of showing God's kindness towards Mephibosheth. Significance outlives you. Great place to take a picture. You can teach it to your kids. White out my name. Use your name. I don't care. Use the African definition of copyright. The right to copy. <laughs> See, significance and success are different. I love what Oprah Winfrey, the billionaire, discovered. The key to realizing a dream is to focus not on success, but significance. And then even the small steps and little victories along your path will take on greater meaning. I want you this year to discover not success. That's fleeting. That's beneath you. Don't aim for that. I want you this year to discover the joy of significance. David's kindness broke the feelings of worthlessness, unimportance, and a lack of value that Mephibosheth struggled with, the shame that had enveloped him, the dark cloud of self-disgust that had so filled the pores of this man's life when he looked at him, his life and his circumstance and where he was, a prince living like a pauper in a place called nothing. And, he, and, and all that was broken. How this king, and it wasn't about his status, his role, it was about this act of kindness and you know the beauty? That Mephibosheth, that shame broke over his life. But something equally important broke over the life of David. Success as the trajectory, the aim, broke. Significance became the road that he'll travel on. I wished I could be a fly on the wall the first time that Mephibosheth ate at David's table. Because David said, I, I don't want to just restore to you all of your father's property. I want you to take your meals with me and eat at my table. I, I don't know how long it took Mephibosheth to, to perhaps shuffle and walk into the, the dining room of David. I, I don't know how big the smile was on his face, but I can imagine it. I wonder how he looked the first time he, he sat down. Someone may have had to help him sit. His legs may have dangled under the table. And he's smiling from ear to ear. Look at me. I'm sitting with the king, taking meal with the princes. Hey, Solomon, pass me a biscuit. <laughs> I, I, can, I, I, I can imagine. And, 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 and as, he's, as he's sitting there, the shame this self-deprecating view of himself, broken, this sense of the devaluing, broken, this sense of you know, just abandonment and of no worth, broken, this sense of being you know, of this, uh, a life that's not worthy to be lived, broken. But something else broke that same day. David, empty, from the pursuits of success, 
smiling from ear to ear. Because when he looked at Mephibosheth, a sense of value, a sense of the personal satisfaction. It wasn't pity that David was demonstrating. It was compassion. It wasn't the, some sense of, here, here just, just, just take the scraps, I, I, I don't care about you. No, 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 no. It, it was this sense of deep empathy, God's kindness. The kindness that says, I want nothing in return but the joy of helping you. David needed Mephibosheth just as much as Mephibosheth needed David. I wonder who it is that's in your life right now. That can stand for you to show them God's kindness. See, what really matters is there's more to life than success. And significance is greater than success. And David learned significance really matters. He discovered something that very few people ever discover. Significance really matters. See, success is public. Significance is personal. People can project success, but no one can project significance. You can dress for success, but you can't dress for significance. How do you dress for significance? See, it's not outward stuff. It's not you having all that, that look where you're, for the guys like a GQ or a woman's ma'am, you look like you were walking on a runway in Paris and you look great, but how do you dress for significance? And I'm not knocking clothing. All I'm saying is that it's not about the outward stuff. Jesus taught that what really matters is not your personal possessions, but your personal performance towards others. Matthew 25, verse 35, makes it so plain. Jesus said, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you look after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. In this passage of scripture, Jesus is describing the judgment day. And he uses the verses prior to this reading, the metaphor of this farmer who separates his, or shepherd, shepherd, separates his sheep from the goat. Sheep are the good animals. Goats are the bad animals. Sheep are the righteous. Goats are the unrighteous. In Bible metaphor. And Jesus says to the righteous, the one who made it into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, you know, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I, I, I was sick and you cared for me. I was imprisoned and you visited me. I, I, I was naked and you gave me clothing. And then the verses that follows verse 36 says, the righteous asks, when were you hungry? When were you sick? When were you naked? When were you, when were you thirsty? When were you in prison? We never did any of those things for you. And Jesus clarified, you didn't do it for me directly. You did it for the least among you. The ones who couldn't repay you. The ones who couldn't reciprocate in kind. The ones who needed your kindness. And when you did that, that's what caught my eye. Wasn't your successes, wasn't your degrees, wasn't your job title, wasn't your bank account, 
It wasn't your stock portfolio. It wasn't any of those things that caught my eye. Jesus didn't say, wow, enter into the kingdom, you who, because you have three degrees from Ivy League schools and you're real sharp person, brilliant physicist, brilliant, you're, you're, you're brilliant businesswoman. You just enter into the kingdom. Jesus didn't say any of those things. And he wasn't knocking physical, earthly successes. We need to do those things. But he's saying, that's not what caught my eye. What caught my eye is when you showed kindness to people that couldn't reciprocate. He says, you move from success to significance, and I validate significance. I laud significance. I applaud significance. I admire significance. Significance is what catches my I. I want you to see how Jesus views it. And it wasn't about possessions. It's never been. It's about small performances. Giving someone a meal. Giving someone a drink. Giving someone a room. Giving someone care. Giving someone a little bit of your time. That's what significance was about. About three years ago, I traveled to Thailand and Myanmar, a country formerly known as Burma. I traveled with Compassion International, this global Christian organization that helps children that are in at-risk countries to evade trafficking, sexual trafficking, and even the devastation of abject poverty. And they do four things for the kids. They educate. They provide for their health needs. They also provide for their spiritual training and journey and development in Christ. And they train them in a craft so they can be able to have gainful employment and have a stream of income when they become of age. And this happens because they work with some of the developed countries some of the European countries here in the States, Canada, and for $38 a month when you sponsor a child, those four things happen. Now, along with the 38 bucks American dollars that you may give to say, I'm sponsoring a child in India, or I'm sponsoring a child in Kenya, or I'm sponsoring a child in, 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 in Myanmar, there's a letter that you would write to the child along with your gift over the course of the year, several letters. And when I was in Thailand, I remember one of the homes we went to visit one of the, child, one of the children that was sponsored by someone in America. It was a, a hut that was in a valley that whenever it rained, the foundation of the hut would wash away and have to rebuild their hut. And the parent was a 17-year-old the older brother of three kids because their parents had passed away. And so the 17-year-old assumed the leadership of his family. And because of the way it was constructed, the hut, only one of us can go into the hut at a time, not because of size, but because it was so frail. And it was raised up about maybe five feet off the, off the ground in terms of, off the ground in terms of stilts so that the water could go underneath it. And so... The leader of the Compassion International says, the worst time that I have to deal with a child that hurts, who's sponsored, getting those four needs met, is when they get no letter from their sponsor. They feel they're of little importance. Significance, it's not about money. Don't fall into the trap where you think that when I make it rich, then I'll help others. No, trap, trap, trap. Don't go that route. Significance is never about money. It's about feelings, not finances. Heart, not, not pocketbook. And so just a little letter. Here in New Jersey, you're on our mind. You're in my prayers. Love you. It means the world to a child. See, success, it, it, don't, don't make success your, your, your benchmark. 
Don't, don't make that the, the, the primary thing on the top of your goal list this year. If you do, then you're just simply a normal human being. I want to be abnormal. I want to swim against the current. I don't want to be someone that shoots for success. I want to be someone that aims for significance. And the beauty about aiming for significance, all you got to do is just have one person in your mind, one person outside of your immediate family, one person, one person, one person, one person, one person that you say, you know something? They've been on my heart. And I want to do something for them. Some, I want to show them God's kindness. What are you going to do? It may be I'm going to babysit for them twice a month. No cost. They have a special needs child. I'm going to, I'm going to learn how to take care of the special needs child just to give them a little reprieve. I'll do that twice a month couple hours so they can go out and just go watch a movie somewhere. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay for, for, for lunch for their kid that I know that you know, they're always struggling. And, and what I'm saying is that, is that you've got to see that success, that's not your trajectory. That doesn't reflect the kingdom that we are part of. That's not your goal. That's not your primary aim. Significance should be. I love what John Maxwell said. Significance and selfishness are two incompatible words. You never see anybody who lives for themselves that ever really becomes significant with other people. David's road to significance began with a genuine sincerity towards Mephibosheth. A genuine desire to help him. Sincerity comes from the heart, the home of compassion and empathy. David's journey to significance was stimulated by true unselfishness. I want you just to come up with one person in your mind right now that you would say, I want to show God's kindness to them over the course of the month. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to be intentional. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be grand. Doesn't have to cost money, but it should reflect God's kindness. And when you do that, you're going to discover, like David, I needed this. It adds to a deeper sense of meaningfulness in my life. I offer these simple answers to you in response to the question, what really matters?